Hey everyone, I'm um, going to give you all a few minutes to see if you get on here. Um, I figured that since I made it through yesterday uh, that I would try this again and maybe read the second chapter of Walking with Ghosts. Um, I want to thank everyone first and foremost for their support in... <laughs> There goes my phone, so we're gonna have dings on this because I forgot to, I forgot to uh, turn the volume down. Hi, Tanya. Um, I'll share this out if you want to, honey. If you think people would be interested. Um, hi, y'all. Um, I want to thank everybody for being so supportive yesterday because that was a tough one. Ding. <laughs> that was a really, really tough chapter to read. Hi, Sandy. Hi, love. Um. I think this is going to be a little bit better. Let's go for a little bit more upbeat, okay? Uh, something a little less traumatic, okay? So we're going to give it a go. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, people can watch this after the fact. Hi, Fergie. Hi, y'all. Hi, Cat. Oh, she called me sexy. I'm reading my glasses. So I can I can see that. Hey, <laughs> girl. I ain't feeling so sexy. <laughs> I, uh, woo, you know, I'm, I'm there. I'm right there. Um, this will hopefully be a treat because this is the first time in this book, In Walking with Ghosts, that I, uh, that I stepped on English soil. And it's, it's important to me. It's a very, very important part of my journey. And I want to share it with you. And, I'm kind of looking at this as this is my treat, my corn treat, if you will. Um, <laughs> that was so lame, by the way, my corn treat. Um, but this is my corn treat uh, to you guys. We can't get out. We can't do anything. Well, fuck it. Let's just read, okay? So, shall we? Uh, this is called England, part one, okay? Nothing could have prepared me for my trip to England. To be honest, I had worried about the activity overseas and how it would affect me. Up to this point, I had never, except for remote viewing and the man, dealt with spirits centuries old. I worried I may be opening Pandora's box, and that, and that thought made me slightly uncomfortable. All the fear melted away as I stepped off the plane in Manchester. It was like coming home after hundreds of years of being away. I can't explain it. I can only say it was a feeling of warmth. Like being wrapped in your favorite blanket, slipping a cup of hot cocoa. Yeah, true story. <laughs> our soul sisters, Abby Thompson and Laura Keats, picked us up and we made our way to a little village of Castleton. The beauty of the land was overwhelming. I wanted to weep with happiness simply from the achievement of getting there. How I kept my composure is beyond me, but I did. We laughed and talked of all the adventures we planned to have during our stay. Even if we didn't have any investigations planned, which we did, of course, you can't be in England and not feel the spirits walking amongst you. It's simply impossible. Castleton provided or proved this on the very first day. Y'all, it's such a cool little town, too. I mean, it really is. I'm going to talk in between this because why the fuck not, right? Um, if you ever get a chance, it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, the stone of the buildings held the emotions of the past like a sponge. Layer upon layer, it cloaked the whole area. We walked the streets, checking out shops as we made our way up to the castle remains. One of the shops held stones and like. I became enamored with this thin, shaved piece of agate, which was called a witch's wand. I bought it, of course, but I knew it was not for me. And I bought it. I had bought it for Gwen, not knowing how important that purchase would be in the months to come. We spent our time walking the castle ruins, which were in surprisingly good shape, then made our way back to the car to head into Sheffield. We were staying with Abby and Laura and needed to get settled in before we started investigating that night. Yep, you guessed it. No rest for the wicked. <laughs> Our first night in England was going to be spent at the Grace Dew Priory with my para family. Dave Newton, Carl Porter, Abby, Laura, Jana, and I were going to investigate a place I had only remote viewed up to this point. I was unbelievably excited about this. 
but I was even more stoked about getting to meet Dave and Carl in person. Apparently, I was so excited. I knocked, uh, when Carl knocked on Abby's door, I ran so fast to greet him. I, f I forgot she had a lip on her doorway and I tripped over it and it threw me into him. Did I mention I'm not the most graceful ballerina on stage? True story. When we went to pick up Dave, I damn near hugged him to death. I got to see his kiddos too. It was, it was so surreal finally seeing these people I held so close to my heart in person. There wasn't even one second of awkwardness as we sped off into the night singing at the top of our lungs. We were having a blast. It didn't take long before we got to the location, then had a little hike to get to the actual priory. That's when I felt my first inkling of fear since I had stepped foot on English soil. It wasn't necessarily that I, nor any of us, were in danger. It was just the sense that we were being watched, judged. As we made our way through the woods, we came upon a clearing where a well stood. Immediately, I saw a woman nearby. I'm not saying she was in the well, but I did feel spirits attached to it. At that moment, it was too difficult to tell who was who. The past was echoing in my head and I could hear multiple voices. They weren't exactly trying to talk to me, not really. It was just daily chatter. The guys began to set up the equipment as I roamed about and got myself together. For those who don't do this sort of thing, here's something you need to know. It's terrifying. <laughs> I don't mean in a danger sort of way, but in a please goddess God, whomever deity, whomever your deity is, please don't let me screw up kind of way. I bet you didn't know that, did you? I live in constant fear that I will give someone the wrong information, that I won't be able to convey what a ghost or a spirit wants me to say, that they won't like me enough to talk with me. How many times have you heard a psychic or a medium or a sensitive say that? I promised I would hold nothing back in this book, so now you know one of my deep, dark little secrets. Fear. I truly believe admitting it makes me a better sensitive, a better communicator of spirits. I hope that it makes them trust me more. All that remained of the priory were, bits, priory were bits and pieces of buildings here and there. Stone framed, glassless windows lent an eerie feeling as you could see the shadows pass back and forth through them. Whether it was paranormal or not remained to be seen, but the effect did its job in getting me in the mood. It was quite cool outside. The slight breeze felt like breathing against my skin. Being at a location like this, it's very easy to romanticize your purpose there. It's almost second nature to feel, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, to feel as if you are the only person in the world to which these spirits can talk. It takes a lot of effort to keep your ego in check, but I highly recommend that you do it. If you don't, I can guarantee the spirits will do it for you. They have no use for pomp and pageantry, and some don't give two hoots about scaring the shit out of you, and that is exactly what they did in less than 10 minutes of us being at this location. <laughs> True story. I was getting ready to take my first live stream appearance when we got the first surprise of the night. When Abby turned on the camera and we all took our places, I barely had two words out of my, out of my mouth before the motion sensors started going off. Now, admittedly, I don't know shit about how most of this equipment works, and I don't really care to. Hell, I don't even own an EVP recorder. But I do know that something has to be moving to set off a motion sensor. In fact, it has to be moving in front of the motion sensor. This probably wouldn't have been a big deal, but all of us were about 10 feet away from the sensors, which were facing the other direction at the time. So I'm fairly certain it wasn't any of us. This happened three times, all a few minutes apart. What a way to start my first live stream, right? This, and what I mean by that, y'all, is the first one I ever did on location at that point. So, woohoo! I couldn't have been more pleased. I was there with some of the, my most favorite people in the world, and my other favorite people were trying to watch and participate in the investigation. We waited just a bit to see if they would set off the sensors again, but they didn't. We moved on and did our EVP sessions. I gave my reading and encouraged the viewers to give theirs. As we settled by the fireplace area, I could sense something very near me. Again, I did not really feel afraid or intimidated, but the feeling of not being alone will creep you out regardless. It wasn't until we viewed the pictures later that I saw how many were actually around me. Um, there's pictures all through this book. 
that are damn okay so just letting you know damn um you might want to pick it up Alrighty, there will be some of you who don't put a lot of stock in orb photographs and truthfully i can't blame you all i can say is in these these pictures have not been altered in any way with the exception of changing them to black and white I can guarantee that those I am sharing were taken without rain or bugs in the air, and I have all the originals to prove it. So there. Okay. As, <laughs> as the fellas continued their EVP session, I felt like I was being called to check out a different part of the grounds. I walked away from the group after telling them that I felt the spirit of a small child, a boy. I was no more than 15 feet away from the gang when I felt tiny hands push me right in the small of my back. I lost my footing and fell forward. I know he didn't mean to push so hard, but I truly believe that was the only way he could get my attention. The only way he could let me know he was really there. Sometimes that's how it works, you know. I've spoken about this a lot. I know that people automatically assume that you just that just because a spirit becomes physical with you that it means it's angry. This little fellow wasn't angry. What he did was not was no more violent than a young child trying to get their mother's attention by touching her. He just wasn't really aware of how much energy he had to use to do that. That's all. I liken it to how it must feel being able to move after being paralyzed. When movement finally comes, it can be uncontrollable, erratic, forceful. That's why I'm so quick to defend a ghost or spirit when someone claims it's being negative, evil, or hurtful. We need to understand before we judge. We finished up and said our goodbyes to everyone that had tuned in. We were exhausted and had a ton of evidence and pictures to go through. Jana and Abby can both get quite picture happy, so I knew we had our work cut out for us. We finished off the evening at McDonald's, per the guy's regular routine, and they dropped us back off at Abby and Laura's. The adventures were just beginning. We were due to leave on a surprise trip for my birthday, the vet, and, and the rest was very much needed. Morning couldn't have come soon enough. Hold up. Lots of pictures. Lots of pictures. Well, shit. Okay, well, that was quick. Let's go ahead and do chapter two. Hi, y'all. Um, because this is my birthday in this chapter, and this was so fucking awesome, okay? Um, this is going to be, we'll just call this chapter three, but it's called My Dream by the Sea, okay? I'm excited. This was so much fun. Okay. I knew where we were going almost as soon as we got into the car. I kept hearing one word reverberate in my head. Whitby. Whitby. The girls would not confirm nor deny whether I was right or not, the little snickers. They <laughs> they kept my gift, which gave nothing away, in the front seat with them, and we settled in to enjoy a wonderful drive through the English countryside. Jenna and I had dozed off and had dozed off and on as jet lag began to settle in. I had never felt more at ease, more loved, really. I mean, I had such good friends, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm in England with my buddies, right? Oh, goodness. I'm more at home than I, than I did inhaling that lush English air. I could actually breathe. It was, wasn't just the company I was keeping, but the place itself. The grass, the trees, the stones jutting out of the ground, the ruins that rose up in the distance begging us to explore them. It all called to me, but nothing, nothing so far in my life had prepared me for the emotional moment of seeing Whitby Abbey looming in the distance. I had tears in my eyes when I viewed it for the first time, nestled in a haze of fog. I knew it. I mean, I really knew it. I knew I had been there before in another time, another life. I walked the grounds at midnight, laying in the grass and stared at the stars. I knew the waves would crash against the rocky cliffs at dusk, leaving you to think the sandy shore had been but a dream. I was like a kid in a candy store. I couldn't get out of the car quick enough, practically clawing at the door handle, so I could get out and get a closer look. It took all I had, making sure I got it here hard at two, took all I had not to squeal like a little schoolgirl when I found out we were staying at the Whitby Hostel, mere yards away from the Abbey. Seriously, folks, you can't possibly know what this meant to me. You see, this particular Abbey was the one written about in the book Dracula. Friggin' Dracula, I tell you, okay? Have I mentioned the, the rather embarrassing affinity that I have for vampires? <laughs> True story. Yeah, I'm that girl. I can't help it. I've been that way all my life. Vampires and werewolves. Those are my people. I think I can relate to the loneliness they must feel. The isolation. I totally get that. 
As we checked into the hostel, I, of course, had to get a pic with the Dracula statue they had in the lobby. If you've never been to Europe and only have those horrible movies of reference regarding hostels, you would be shocked at how fabulous they are, at least regarding the Whitby Hostel. We were welcomed by a beautiful cherry wood detailing against warm-toned walls. Honey, comfortable, even the creak of the staircase as we made our way up to our room had a lyrical quality to it. Our room had minimal furnishings and no TV, but we didn't care. We had exploring to do. Our first stop was, of course, the Abbey. We couldn't go inside, but we could get close enough. Abby and Jana got some amazing shots. Next, we headed into the cemetery on the grounds. Something you rarely see in America is a grave over 400 years old. Here, the ground was littered with them, beautifully aged head to headstones that told a story with few words. It was akin to stepping back in time or into a history book. Entire families had lain there for centuries. I didn't sense them watching us, however. I imagined they had become quite used to being gawked at by people like myself, much like the quaint little church just steps away had numerous visitors over the years. I couldn't help but wonder, though, if the church had once seen someone like myself. I'm not saying I'm all that great, but I was curious what such an aged religious institution would think of a proud, card-carrying pagan, a practitioner of the craft, if you will. Surprisingly enough, I wasn't propelled back, nor did I burst into flame when I entered this holy place. I was, however, dumbstruck by the artifacts that were on display in the tiny church. I was most moved by the infant-sized coffin at the back of the church. I could not imagine having to place a child so tiny into something so cold. Forever. I still think about that to this day. I could have stayed in that church for hours, but we had so much to see and nowhere near enough time to see it all. We headed down a massive flight of stairs leading down to the town, snapping pictures left and right. We couldn't get enough of it. We wanted to capture every moment so we could remember it always. We had no idea until we looked closer at the pictures that we had a guest. In many of the photos, we had a large, large glowing orange orb following us. Footnote, when I say large, I mean like basketball size, beach ball size, okay? You know how I'm always making jokes, beach ball size lady nuts, because I got them? Beach ball size glowing orange orb. True story, okay? All right, just so we're clear on that, all right? Um, okay. <laughs> In many of the photos, we had a large glowing orange orb following us. To my knowledge, this had not shown up until we got to Whitby. In one of the pictures that we took whilst on the pier, it showed up on the sandy beach about 500 feet away. It's important to note that there were no reflective surfaces and no flash was used. Even if there had been, I can't come up with a situation in which a beach ball sized fire colored orb could show up in our pictures. If you can, by all means, please let me know. We didn't focus on the orbs or anything paranormal while we walked around. We were tourists having the time of our lives, and honestly, I don't want to focus on anything other than having a good time. The only deviation to that plan was a small amount of time we spent on the cliffs. I kind of went into what Jana calls my super spidey mode. When I do this, I'm being driven by spirits and cannot recollect what happens afterwards. This time was different since I knew exactly why I was being led to where I was going. I could hear the girls yelling at me as I hopped over the safety fence and began to climb the rocks on the ro on the Oceanside Cliff. That's me. That's your girl. Yep, I do that shit. Uh, no more than 20 feet ahead of me, I found what I was looking for. Hidden beneath the tall brush and scattered stones at a small video camera. Red in color. It looked quite expensive. I leaned down to pick it up, but before I had it in my hands, I saw the image of a woman plummeting off the cliff. The vision was so vivid, I actually gasped. In that moment, I was so afraid of that camera, so afraid that if I picked it up and turned it on, I would see the image that was now burned in my brain. I did it anyway, but I didn't try to turn it on until I was back with the girls who stayed behind the safety fence. I told them what I had seen, and we all held our breath as we tried to turn on the camera. I think we all let out a sigh of relief when nothing happened. No, power, no red power light, no sound. Relief. I gently opened the casing of the camera, and there was no recording device in it either. It had been removed. 
This made me wonder. In fact, I will always wonder why it had been removed. If you could see these cliffs, you would know that it had that if it had been thrown, there was no way it could have landed where it did, nor could it have done that had it been dropped accidentally from above. So what happened? We will never know. I only know I will never forget what I saw moments before I picked it up. Let's see how much longer this one is. Some will keep you all day. Okay, I think we're good. Spent for, <laughs> spent for the day, we made our way back to the hostel. It had been lovely. We'd eaten at a place called Magpies. And, and by the way, that place has burned three times. True story, once after we came home. We'd eaten at a place called Magpies and had one of the best donuts you could imagine from a little stand just off the pier. We bought fudge from this tiny little shop and gorged ourselves on it. With the exception of the vision, it had been a perfect day. We were heading into Edinburgh the next morning and I had a radio interview I had to do. So after walking through the darkened cemetery, we settled in to rest for the evening. My radio interview was in the middle of the night, England time, so that it could air at a decent hour in America. I gently shut the door to our room so I wouldn't wake the girls and made my way down to the common room of the hostel. It took a little bit to get things up and running for the show, but in the end all went fine. I should have known a simple interview would turn into a remote viewing session, but I didn't mind. It was kind of fun as I felt like I had an audience even though I was all by myself. After the interview, I stepped outside for a cigarette and ended up talking with this fellow for about 30 minutes. He spoke about music and books and I told him everything about my writing and he told me about his band and the places they had played. The subject veered into the paranormal and as he talked about his personal experiences, I was completely fascinated by what he was telling me. He spoke of an experience he had had with his family while they were camping and about the stranger who had come up to them needing help but wasn't really there. He was a ghost. He and his family even knew it as they were speaking to him but were afraid to startle him since he did not appear to realize he was dead. He was begging them to help his family who were still in the car that had crashed very close to where they were. They all followed the spirit to the site only to see no vehicle and the man disappeared right before their eyes. It was obvious the man is affected still to this day and that's honestly how it works folks. When you are touched by something paranormal you just aren't the same again. Ever. Our minds, fears, egos, and beliefs have immense difficulty in wrapping around the idea of life after death. I think it's because we use the words life and death. The words are so black and white that we forget there are many shades of gray. If we could get past our own imagined limitations, I think we could begin the process of understanding and accepting so much more. It was so nice to just stand there and listen to another person's story to help if needed, but not to be asked to do parlor tricks. I needed that so much. He truly helped me way more than I did him by simply trusting me enough to talk about it. After we finished our smokes and said our goodbyes, I made my way back up to the room. Silence had fallen over the hostel like a blanket. As I crawled under mine, I, left the sweet, I let the sweet piece of sleep take me. Tomorrow would come soon. All right, that's all you're getting today, okay? Because there's just a shit ton of pictures in here. This is, like I said, my longest book, um, and it's just got... A ton of pictures. Um, when I read again tomorrow, it will be about Edinburgh, Scotland. You're going to want to li listen to that because that was crazy. Okay. Um, anybody have any questions, comments? Vanessa, quit reading. <laughs> Anything? What can I work on? What do I need to work on? Are you guys good? Everybody happy? How's your quarantine going, loves? Because this is what I'm doing, okay? Let me see. Oh, thank you, Kat. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm not the best orator, you know? I'm not. And I, I, I feel kind of stupid because I'm, I'm like this, you know, when I'm trying to read you guys something. But, you know, even my old lady glasses aren't helping a lot. Hi, David. Y'all, that, that's David Lee Newton. That is my brother from another mother. Hey, buddy. He is the one that I almost killed him when I was hugging him in England. That is my dude. I swear. We we are siblings. There's no doubt in, no doubt in our minds. We knew it. That's my bro. So, um, I'm just, it pleases me so much to know he was watching. Oh, cat. <laughs> Girlfriend, I sound ridiculous. I, it's like, how do I, how do I do this? I'm like, I gotta sit back. 
As I told somebody, uh, my thing is I sound like a dime store Southern Belle. Yep, dime store Scarlett O'Hara right here, bitches. Um, but no, this is kind of fun, isn't it? I think this is kind of fun. I'm enjoying it. So, oh, I so said I'm going, I'm going cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake, T. I mean, true story, good, true. True story. Um, yeah, Dave, I am going to get my happy ass over there again as soon as I possibly can. We have got shit to do. We have got places to investigate, okay? So, oh, and like we talked about, grab the whole fam, okay? So get, get all the kids. We need to cook out. I'll make barbecue, okay? Um, so, yes, tomorrow, tomorrow we will be, oh, goodness. Um, let me show you the, see, but Edinburgh. Edinburgh, Scotland. That's what we're going to be doing tomorrow, okay? You guys are awesome. I fucking love y'all. Okay, so thanks for making me not feel stupid. Because I am, I can read it in my head all day long, but reading it out to you guys, I'm like, oh fuck, I just messed up that word. Okay, but I love y'all. I love y'all so much. And let's do this same time tomorrow. Okay? All right, mm -hmm. kisses.